Hello, everyone. Welcome to our afternoon panel. Um, I have the honor of introducing all three of our speakers this afternoon. Um, I will read all three bios, and then I will come in with the names of their talks in between each uh, conversation. So they'll stay fresh in your mind before you hear the speaker. Um, so all three speakers today. Uh, first, we'll hear from Dr. Ross Brooks. He is a historian of science. And his work focuses on originating queer perspectives on the history of biology and eugenics and reappraisal of the sexological ideas of Charles Darwin. Ross has published articles in leading journals, including Archives of Natural History, the Journal of the History of Medicine and Allied Sciences, Notes and Records, the Royal Society Journal of the History of Science, and the Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society. In June 2019, he acted as contributing editor for the first queer-themed edition of Viewpoint, the magazine of the British Society for the History of Science. He is a recipient of the Stern Prize, awarded by the History for the, awarded by the Society for the History of Natural History History of Natural History. Ross has recently appeared in the pioneering nature documentary Queer Planet, and he is a fellow of the Linnaean Society of London. Second, we'll hear from Christopher Donahue. Christopher Donahue is a historian at the National Human Genome Research Institute at the NIH. He has edited and co-edited two journal collections since 2018. Two others, Vitalism and the Contemporary Life Sciences with Charles Wolfe and Perspectives on the Union Genome Project and Genomics with Alan Love are under review. A further volume for Patterns of Prejudice on Slavdom, Genes, and Race Science between Nation, ba nation Building and the Global Racial Imaginary is in preparation with Victoria Schmidt and Christian Prometzer. He is also completing a book under contract for Central U European University Press entitled The Master Race in That Sense, Defenses of Eugenics and Sterilization After the Second World War. And third, we'll hear from Os Keys, a PhD candidate at the University of Washington who studies gender, technology, and power. An inaugural Ada Lovelace Fellow, their current project explores the history of scientific research in and around transgender health, and they have previously done extensive work on artificial intelligence and acted as an expert advisor to subnational, national, and supranational legislatures. Uh, so her, first, we're going to hear from Dr. Brooks on the subject of genomics, eugenics, and the twilight sexes from Darwin, from Darwin to gay genes. Uh, go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much, Cass, indeed. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, um, it really is a great pleasure to be talking to you today, which I'm doing from my flat on the south coast of England. I'm quite close to Brighton. Um, what uh, an amazing, positive, informative event this has been so far. Uh, thank you, Dr. Green, um, such an inspiring talk this morning. Uh, Liz, Brittany, and everyone else who's making such a fantastic job of uh, making what is a huge and complex operation just seem so effortless and so simple. And a uh, very special thanks to my fellow panelists, Cass, Oss, Chris, uh, for being so brilliant. Um, but, but most of all, um, one of my latest slides, I quote from Ernst Mayer, who is one of those um, evolutionary biologists, one of the architects of the modern synthesis. And he said, most scientific problems are far better understood by studying their history than their logic. Um, often when I give a presentation, I have to spend a great deal of time trying to make that case, but I really don't feel that I have to do that today. I feel very comfortable and, and happy um, at the amount of um, integrated analysis that there has been um, with um, historical perspectives, with the today perspectives. Um, Certainly, Melissa Wilson, I think it was, who raised the notion of the X and Y chromosomes being um, uh, historically termed sex chromosomes. That has such an interesting history, uh, a very troubled one that we still live with the legacies of. And there was also that very interesting question um, that somebody asked um, about scientific advances being wrought from studies of intersex. Um, and it was very interesting to see how that concerned panelists, because there is, you know, such a host of problems. I mean, yes, um, really, from a historical perspective, that is pretty much how the genetics of sex emerged, almost wholly wrought from queer bodies, uh, non-human um, and, and human. And yeah, the problematics, I mean, I think it was Sam Sharp who, who originally um, mentioned eugenics, and we just had the most amazing uh, presentations um, about the, you know, the, the, the 
the importance and significance of the histories of eugenics and how utterly entwined it has been with um, genetics. So I hope very much that my presentation um, will continue to make the case, which I think Bean's made um, uh, particularly eloquently about thinking historically and scientifically um, um, as one. When I spoke um, previously at a previous event, um, the meaning of eugenics symposium, it was in um, December 2021, um, I focused very much on the post, the immediate post-war period after 1945 and the continuity of eugenics. Um, this time I want to um, take a much more broader overview. I really am going to do a romp through the, through the decades. Um, uh, one of the more dispiriting aspects of growing older as a historian is that one's own youthful experiences suddenly take on new kind of historical interest and become kind of historical artifacts in and of themselves. And I've recently made it my business to kind of uh, look out um, some of the texts from which uh, the youthful me first read something about sex. And I've become very interested in this and I ask other people and they're really, I know exactly which text to go for, you know, um, one's youthful mind when one starts having questions about sex and gender um, and um, uh, sexualities. You know, those first texts that we read um, really do have a, a, a deep influence in our minds and are not always uh, for the best. Um, I, I put here, growing up gay in 1970s and 80s Britain, spoiler alert, it wasn't great. Um, and really, if we were ever subjected to um, narratives about sex development and sex determination, um, oh my gosh, I mean, looking at them now, uh, they, they were so minimalistic, so reductionist, um, uh, so deterministic. The example I put on my screen here is a little bit before my time. Um, I chose it because I was the last year to do O-levels, and this is kind of a typical O-level text, um, very typical of the kind of um, uh, uh, narratives about sex determination that we were um, uh, uh, exposed to. Um, very much, um, you know, why X, Y, you get a boy and a man, um, and X, X, a girl, you will turn into a woman. Nothing in and of itself wrong with that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great opening line for a very long, broad conversation. But sadly, that, that conversation just never happened. And this was pretty much all we've had. And so somewhat belatedly, in life, um, it took me too long. Um, actually, um, going to university at a, a later stage in life really just made me think about these um, narratives and the production of narratives about sex determination and sex development very, very differently. Um, and it would be too easy to construct a Whiggish historical narrative which asserts that the genetics of sex originated in, in this very kind of um, simplistic, basic way. And only in recent years um, uh, have they diversified in, in response to um, improved technology and greater social awareness of the multiplicity of sexes and genders um, and sexualities um, among non-human animals and, and people. Um, but nothing could be further from the truth. Um, it has been it's surprising. I mean, really doesn't do it justice at all. Um, when one thinks of these kind of um, uh, god awful narratives that, that, that we were exposed to um, as, as kids in, in the 70s and 80s, um, just how different things were before that time. Um, we've also we've already had um, uh, various examples of this. Um, um, Bing's uh, Belosi's wonderful presentation. Um, certainly drew this out um, of how um, the first geneticists uh, really had a, a, a pretty firm grip um, on the uh, malleability of sex and intersexualities uh, and, and sex changes um, in, 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 in uh, now different ways in genetics, endocrinology. And that um, goes even further back to Darwin, who I, who I've written um, a lot about. Um, 
certainly, again, one doesn't just grow up with narratives about sex um, and, and genders. Um, but we also grow up with, with histories, histories of science, um, which are often communicated in quite subtle ways, perhaps through David Attenborough's programmes. I think that's probably when I first heard about um, Charles Darwin. And I think we're quite familiar with, with the kind of the, the um, sexual selection narratives, which were um, deeply embedded in the Victorian social and gender mores of the time, um, you know, replete with, with um, narratives about aggressive males and, and, and fussy females, and that's all there with Darwin, but there is something else as well. Um, he was fascinated by um, uh, intersexualities, um, sex changes, particularly in birds, avian sex reversal, what gets called sex role reversal, um, gynandromorphs, uh, particularly insects, butterflies, which have um, either half and half, half male, half female, or they might have um, patches of maleness and femaleness. Darwin was as interested in, in that um, as we are. Um, and certainly when it comes to uh, humans, he was very interested, as were um, so many of the early evolutionists, in the male breast. Why, why did men have nipples? Um, he wrote loads about this, um, and also uh, what was called at the time the uterus masculinus, masculine that's Latin for, for male uterus, which is a small rudimentary structure. Today it's called prostatic utricle, um, and understood to be homologous, um, certainly in Darwin's time it was, um, with, with uh, the, the, a, a uterus, um, and all male mammals have this rudimentary structure. And this led Darwin to um, talk a lot about latent sex. I put one quote here, um, uh, which he wrote in the privacy of his notebooks, every man and woman is hermaphrodite. But he also wrote a lot about latent sex as well. He insisted, um, and I'll, I'll put it into his own words, um, which he wrote in 1868. But I must explain what is meant by characters lying latent. The most obvious illustration is afforded by secondary sexual characters. In every female, all the secondary male characters, and in every male, all the secondary female characters apparently exist in a latent state, ready to be evolved under certain conditions. And this interest in this, this reaching for a kind of uh, a scientific framework for understanding the diversities of um, uh, sexes and genders and uh, sexualities in the natural world continues um, with the discoveries of um, X and Y chromosomes. X um, discovered uh, 1891 and Y chromosomes in 1905. Um, and within a very short time, actually even before the, 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 um, the Y chromosome is discovered, um, William Bateson in particular, who's one of the, the, the first Mendelian geneticists, um, he immediately seizes on this, not as an explanation for understanding singular concepts, uh, simplistic concepts of male and female. He seizes on these discoveries for understanding sex variations, particularly gynandromorphs. Um, again, I'll just give you a flavor of, of, of what he said. He was speaking, um, uh, this is the presidential address of the meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in Cambridge in August 1904, a really, really early stage. And he just waxes lyricals about um, sex mosaicism, um, particularly by Andromorphs. Um, and he's, he compares these to um, other characteristics that are being explained um, in, Men in Mendelian terms. And he says, I therefore look forward with confidence to the elucidation of the real nature of sex, that redoubtable mystery. And this continues um, right through the first half of, of the 20th century, there's this absolute fascination with sex variants, um, particularly uh, animals. Um, I put my image here, is of um, a, a popular kind of serialized um, science uh, magazine, The Science of Life, um, hugely popular, both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, Julian Huxley, um, certainly one of the most famous um, uh, biologists of his day, was fascinated um, by um, this kind of new science of sex, uh, this new um, uh, genetics of sex. And you can see um, his issue, um, the article he wrote on, on sex determination is illustrated by this beautiful image of, of um, all, the, all the specimens down the center are intersexed. Um, certainly I, I've, I, I have my own copy of it here um, and just, just flicking through it um, really, um, 
emphasizes the centrality, the pivotal nature of um, uh, uh, intersex animals, um, free martins, um, uh, castrated animals are something that, that um, Beans Velosi um, was talking about, his experience on, on rodents. Um, and, and really, um, reversal of sex. Uh, there are feminine men and masculine women in body and mind. Um, and really, again, just to compare that, I mean, this is how young people, this is how adults uh, popularly learned about sex um, in the 1920s from a multiplicity of sources. Um, such a stark contrast to the kind of um, texts that um, uh, people of my generation, as I, I said earlier, were exposed to um, uh, later on in the 70s and 80s. And certainly, all, every historian who's gone looking um, at this earlier period has been surprised, I think, at, at what they found. I've just put a couple of examples here. Um, Sarah S. Richardson um, states that the pioneers of sexological genomics, um, genetics, understood sex as a complicated, spectrum-like, and highly variable phenomenon. They were fascinated by the diversity of forms of sexual dimorphism and intersexuality in nature. Cases of hermaphrodites, uh, free martins, um, uh, gynandromorphs um, uh, appeared regularly in the scientific literature and were presented as holding the key to unraveling the biology of sex. And Helga Satzinger has made a very similar statement. Um, they've uh, studied uh, concepts of sex and gender in mainly German genetics. And so why is it that the earlier generations, I, I must say, I don't want to overly um, uh, state the case here, um, you know, um, or, or glamorize these earlier um, uh, narratives of sex. Certainly, um, by today's standards, the science was very basic and there's, there's a lot of speculation. Um, uh, the, the very dated rhetoric, um, I've, I've referred to sex variations, I'm glossing over the terminologies that were used at the time, often the term abnormalities were, were, were used. Um, and some rampant animal-human analogies, which is an issue that's come up on multiple um, talks today. I mean, really, wow, looking at um, uh, reading some of these really is quite eye-watering. Um, and also, there's very little about psychology um, or gender identity. A lot of the, the, the um, kind of almost celebration, of, uh, uh, I'm calling the sex variations in these texts, um, very much on, on physical uh, transformations of sex and with sexualities. And therein lies the root of, of how and why um, things change. The human, the human element really kicks in. Um, certainly one input into why things change is, is greater knowledge of the, the human uh, chromosomal complement that becomes established quite slowly, actually, through the 1920s, really quite late. And it's from around the mid-20s that, that scientists are talking um, much more uh, confidently about um, XX and XY for humans. Um, but as this conversation, as humans start to take center stage in geneticists' um, writings about uh, sex, it, it, absolutely cursed from the outset. I mean, genetics is born into this culture of eugenics, um, which um, uh, uh, Beans has already given us some, some flavors of. Um, certainly, eugenics has um, a, a, a very um, ambiguous set of so associations with changing concepts of, of, of sexualities and, and um, sex and, and gender. Many um, queer people embraced eugenics. Um, an absolute prime example is, is Max Hirschfeld in Germany, who um, tried um, uh, to infuse um, uh, a kind of homophile, he was himself homosexual, um, but also, also eugenics, a eugenicist as well. Um, and so these narratives, scientists' narratives about um, sex, although on the one hand, they're trying to negotiate um, the the um, great variety of sexes in the natural world and among uh, humans, um, we also see 
some rampant, chronic gender stereotyping um, in, in these texts. And so I've just chosen one example here, hugely popular, Amram uh, Scheinfeld, uh, you and Heredity in 1939, um, and you can see in common with um, Huxley's Science of Life, um, he's explaining in, in very simple terms that young people would understand, teaching young people and um, parents about um, this new, exciting um, uh, science, genetics of sex. Um, it says a, a basic understanding of sex determination, we get oddities in sex, lots of um, uh, hermaphrodites, um, uh, as they, the term was at the time, um, animals, snail there, um, but also um, results of kind of castration experiments, um, how a dynamic morph may be formed. Um, you can see half and half, half male, half female there. Um, but certainly most interesting is this kind of is this spectrum um, of, of human sexes, which um, Schein felt uh, represents um, with, with this image, uh, with a, an average man on one side, average woman on the other side, and this kind of grades in the middle. And this is this is very typical of, of you know many texts in the um, uh, 1920s. Um, but also at the same time, we get this this kind of eugenic discourse, which relies so um, uh, profoundly on on stereotypes and um, see desirable traits in women. Um, but, you know. Uh, socially and, and eugenically. Um, there's no comparable uh, diagram for desirable traits in men. Um, there really is a, a serious gender skew. And on top of this, um, the, um, is another closely asso associated with eugenics, um, is, is a, a, a very, very important development, um, which is that through the 1920s, Scientists, science writers feel that they are on the brink of developing a means of manipulating whether a, uh, uh, an egg is fertilized by an X or Y chromosome. Spoiler alert, they're not. It doesn't happen for a long, long time. Um, but the demand for this and the, uh, the media furore around this um, is an absolute tidal wave. It changes the terms in which um, sex is described um, really so much big going out the window uh, very highly um, stereotyped representations of, of boy babies and girl babies really um, sweeping away certainly um, barely any mention of endocrinology um, yet alone um, the, the kind of the, the sex variant animals and, and spectrum human spectrum of, um, of sexes that shine felt that have tried to represent um, and this really um, it has historical importance um, that goes beyond sex, sexes and genders and, and sexualities, because this really is the moment when most people first learn about genetics at all uh, through popular narratives. Um, there's a lot of quackery going on, a lot of claims, um, a lot of articles being written, lots of newspaper articles about all these different um, methods that are supposedly being um, uh, um, uh, developed in order for sex control uh, practices uh, to become widespread and, and kind of the ethics of that is, is, is virtually non-existent. Um, looking, like I say, I spoke before about the, the post-1945 um, era um, where we really do start to see these kind of very um, uh, simplistic reductionist narratives uh, coming to the fore. Um, at the same time, a very um, pernicious eugenic rhetoric around uh, homosexuality, around trans people, around uh, queer people, people generally, um, which we still live with the legacies of, of this today. Um, uh, and it has such deep historical roots. Um, uh, I put an example here from the Daily Mail, the UK uh, Daily Mail, uh, just to give a flavour of the, uh, you know, the great gay genes debacle uh, which was a worldwide media furore, uh, which I remember very, very well through reading articles like this in the, in the Daily Mail. It really was, it was very, very scary. Um, and I'm sure nobody listening needs me to give further examples of, of, of how that is playing out um, today. And sadly, it does in, in scientific books and, and articles um, still. Um, so 
just to finish up, I put some key points there. Um, really, the main point I would like to make, just in having spoken about eugenics, um, and also um, seeing um, how um, institutions, particularly University College London, where, where um, Galton and, and his associates um, uh, set up a, the Galton Laboratory, um, and how institutions are now dealing with those legacies. And one of the key lessons from that is how responsibility uh, for the legacies um, of the eugenic abuses, historic um, and, and current, uh, with which we, we all live, um, it's, it's ongoing. You can't just draw a big black line, say sorry, and think you can move on without mentioning it again. It's ongoing and it's um, on our shoulders. Um, everybody's shoulders um, to uh, keep being vigilant. Uh, and um, It's why this event has been um, uh, so heartening um, and, and really I'm most grateful um, uh, to, to be invited to come to speak. I've covered a lot of ground. I really did romp through the decades in, in, a, in a very um, bounding fashion. I'm um, hopefully just given a flavor of, of the kind of the ways um, sex determination and sex uh, development have been uh, 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 narrated and those those um, narratives change over time. And so I've just packed out my last slide um, for um, anyone who wants to find out more. And um, there really is a growing literature. Um, uh, again, very exciting like, with events like this and the scholarship that's being done. Really, uh, I think I find so much to look, hope uh, looking forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next talk by Dr. Christopher Donahue is Why Chromosome Research from Stigma to Science. Thanks so much, Ross and Cass. Uh, Ross, you've really uh, set me up with this beautiful talk that you just gave, and I will be exploring some of the same themes. Uh, I'm just going to very quickly share my screen. So as I said, um, or as uh, Cass said, I'm, I'm Christopher Donahue, and the title of my talk is Why Chromosome Research uh, from Stigma to Science. Uh, and this is just uh, a disclaimer which says that um, the views and opinions expressed in this presentation don't necessarily reflect those of the United States government, and information uh, in this talk um, uh, shouldn't really be posted or transmission without the explicit permission of the author. I should also say that um, some of the materials that I'm quoting from are sometimes quite disturbing, and these are, are going to be quotations from the works and words of historical actors, and these words are not mine. I want to say that I'm firmly anti-eugenic, and I also want to say that much of this is new research from a, from a book that I've just finished. So Ross has talked, as I said, uh, just really, I think, impactfully and meaningfully about some of these themes, but some initial observations. So the historical and present day connections between genetics and genomics research are complex. And while many scholars, uh, such as uh, Marius Torda and Alex Mina Stern, have outlined the eugenics movement and its uh, development to genetic science and to other uh, modern advances in scientific knowledge. The history of these connections is really still being written after 1945, so after the post-war period. So eugenics after the Second World War entails specific surveillance, stigmatization, medicalization of already marginalized groups because of a because of the presumed definite connections between biology, genetics, and behavior. So, uh, and as a last point for this slide here, eugenic, reductionistic rhetoric, and post-war genetics often became fixated on so-called, quote-unquote, intellectual disability, uh, quote-unquote, antisocial and uh, aggressive behavior, and its purported connections to an extra sex chromosome. So why chromosome research um, after uh, uh, the in the 1920s to the 1950s uh, was mired in poorly designed uh, eugenic studies? Uh, Kurt Stern, in a 1957 paper, 
attempted to ascertain the evidence of traits that, that were inherited, uh, quote, through the Y chromosome or, quote, all uh, of all of the sons and all of the daughters. And you can obviously see some of the rhetoric and assumptions playing out here. Um, Kurt Stern is a really interesting case and presents some really interesting questions for historians. Uh, in both his private and public and private statements, Stern, uh, who was a past president of the American Society for Human Genetics um, and a, a central figure in the history of, of genetics, was a fierce advocate of eugenics and population control. Um, he assented to uh, an early version of so-called replacement theory and was closely associated with the California eugenics movement law at Berkeley. Um, later in life, he actually considered his work on the Y chromosome and human behavior genetics to be his legacy in genetics and his legacy in genetics at Berkeley. Um, on the other hand, um, this Y chromosome um, linkage paper dispelled uh, many of many superstitions while also affirming a, a fair number of them. And he also uh, has a very complicated relationship with introducing, I think, less dehumanizing uh, vocabulary around intellectual disability in the American Journal of Human Genetics. Um, Stern is um, interesting, simple, is, is a, a complicated figure. And I think uh, thinking about his scientific accomplishments uh, it, it makes uh, thinking about his uh, contributions to eugenics and eugenics ideology all the more important. So in his discussion of so-called Y traits, uh, in the discussion of so-called Y traits by, uh, by R.R. Gates and William Castle and others, Stern argued that any conclusions uh, were premature uh, in these Y chromosome studies uh, due the, to the very small number of relevant individuals. And he also acknowledged incomplete penetrance, which is an important concept and incomplete penetrance was an issue in the history of genetics and the history of eugenic ideology, which posed uh, a significant number of problems uh, theoretically for this ideology of eugenics. Uh, going forward a little bit into the 60s, nevertheless, there were flawed studies which compound stigma around genetics and behavior. So uh, by 1965, um, in the uh, paper noted on the right of my screen, uh, there was the, uh, the myth of quote unquote super male aggression and the XYY male, which developed out of the critical use of small study populations and low power in the 1960s through the 1980s and beyond. In the US, um, an important aspect of all of these studies uh, was um, the, the Johnson administration's 1969 National Commission on the Causes and Prevention of Violence. So this was the report that stated, this is the report speaking, not myself. Why are some uh, people more likely to commit violent crimes than others? Um, there appears to be no single cause of individual violence. Rather, a variety of factors seem to trigger violent behavior, each operating differently with different people. Genetic makeup may be involved, as our, uh, as our intelligence, emotional states, attitudes, and values. And, and for um, uh, a key detail is this, uh, this report is uh, just four or five years after the infamous uh, Moynihan report on the Black family, which engaged, I think, in a, in a similar kind of reduction of, of very uh, complex social life and deep history to these very sort of uh, easy to explain causes. So as many have pointed out, uh, the discussion around uh, having a, a so-called extra Y chromosome or a supernumerary Y uh, and its uh, connection to aggressive behavior, so-called and, and quote unquote mental subnormality uh, is again, a kind of return to the born criminal of 19th century phrenology. Um, these studies uh, through uh, the 1980s, and even I think until today, really suffer from a kind of uh, uh, invidious uh, confounding. Uh, 
uh, because many of these studies were done in institutional settings where there is a clearly sufficient, indeed overwhelming, uh, 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 purely social ex uh, explanations for uh, so-called aggression and antisocial behavior. And even these terms, aggression and antisocial behavior, are very much uh, uh, sort of uh, terms that have been weaponized by, by eugenicists and others to deep signify in a, in a deep way that these individuals, for whatever reason, are outside of the social norm and outside of the social polity. And these kinds of studies, which essentially say that there is a there, there is a clear genetic influence on complex social behavior because of the presence or absence of a chromosome, are um, really uh, trying to dodge uh, a classic problem in medical sociology, which is, um, uh, for example, are people subject to mental health crises because of, for example, downward social mobility, or are they downwardly socially mobile because of their health status? So uh, one, uh, the, the former is something called social influence and the latter is social, uh, uh, social selection. And this is a deep problem in sociology and the social sciences. And again, many of these studies, while not only being dehumanizing, are also trying to essentially determine uh, uh, simple, uh, simple answers to very complex questions. And I just want to emphasize that although I'm uh, talking about this research historically, there's no evidence of any link between an extra supernumerary quote-unquote sex chromosome and quote-unquote criminality or antisocial behavior or anything like that. Um, nevertheless, although these reductionistic dehuman and dehumanizing studies have been disproven, these kinds of uh, papers do still exist in the present and, um, occasion and um, often uh, are, are published and I think Ross also alluded to this um, in sort of a, an, a, another domain, or a really, I should say, a related domain. So compounding all of this is that post-war medical genetics textbooks often perpetuated uh, eugenic myths. So Vogel and Matulski, which is a, which is a classic uh, genetics textbook that uh, I imagine even uh, many in the audience uh, have uh, used or studied from, adopted uh, shifting eugenic language to discuss gen uh, the connections between genetics, disability, and chromosome number and reputed social behavior. So throughout the 1980s in the upper right, uh, there was a focus in Vogel and Matulski and, uh, and other works, uh, especially on so-called feeble-mindedness, so-called behavior disorders, and its connections to so-called fitness and fertility. So in the uh, a a snippet of the figure in the upper right, um, you, you see vocabulary, you see ca categorizations that I'm not going to enunciate that would not be out of place in the 1930s. And I think this really shows an important continuity of eugenic language around intellectual disability, complex social behavior, um, and genetics, um, uh, and, as well as genetics. Uh, while in the 1990s, and this is the snippet on the bottom right, uh, Vogel and Matulski perpetuated the myth of quote-unquote antisocial behavior and quote-unquote impaired intellectual function uh, and employed uh, rhetoric such as the tip of the iceberg uh, in their discussions around uh, Jacob's condition or XYY. Um, very often, I and other presentations have linked uh, this kind of rhetoric around genes and crime and so-called juvenile delinquency uh, uh, and obsessions around uh, purported uh, atypicality uh, to wider discussions in the United States and elsewhere around genes and crime and even leading up as a kind of prelude to more well-known works such as The Bell Curve, which was published in 1994 and has had a considerable um, uh, academic and intellectual sort of discussion for now decades. It is also considered to be one of the premier works of uh, genetically informed eugenic thinking and scientific racism uh, 
in the post-war period, I should add. So it's worth also emphasizing that the NIH uh, played a significant role in perpetuating many of these uh, uh, vicious and untrue stereotypes uh, around um, uh, chromosomal variation. So there was the recommendations of the NIMH uh, quote unquote task force on homosexuality, and that's the picture in the bottom left, which was published in 1969. Uh, which included uh, discussion of the so-called treatment and prevention of the uh, so-called uh, homosexual orientation. And this is the snippet in the upper right. Uh, as part of this task force, uh, the infamous um, John Money of the John Joan Medical Ethics Breach and a lifelong NICHD grantee in this report, and this is on the upper left, uh, referred to the quote-unquote extra X as being the quote unquote stigmata uh, of the uh, syndrome in terms of uh, Kleinfelter. And uh, money in this uh, document uh, around uh, uh, sort of supposed uh, uh, environmental and genetic contributions to, uh, to homosexuality, uh, so-called uh, uh, money falsely characterized Kleinfelter individuals as having quote unquote psychosexual pathologies, including quote unquote homosexuality and quote unquote transsexualism. Now, I just want to emphasize too that there is no evidence for this continued uh, eugenic rhetoric either. So all of this um, is to say that um, there's a broad uh, weaponization of uh, so-called sex chromosomes and disability after the second world. So, the genetics and medical literature, uh, particularly the behavior genetics literature, and there's a there's a really complicated behavior genetics background to all the to all of my discussions here, uh, make the frequent association between uh, sex quote unquote uh, chromosomal abnormalities uh, such as Kleinfelter and quote unquote feeble mindedness quote unquote feminization and quote unquote lack in, of initiative. And in the case of Jacob's condition, quote unquote, mental subnormality, quote unquote, criminality, and quote unquote, antisocial behavior. Medical geneticists dehumanized both these groups by frequently talking about them together in, in, in the same report and essentially seeing them as, as sort of variants to be studied, uh, tracked, and distinguished uh, according to a predetermined sort of gradation. Um, in particular, intellectual disability and post-war genetics discussions show a significant racialization around paranoid uh, anxieties and weaponization around masculinity and other traits, even long after such claims could be evident, evident, evidentarily viewed as myths. Again, very important was the role of the NIH uh, in propagating at least some of these myths in the 1970s. So this is the picture of the upper in the upper right where a, uh, a, a kind of blue ribbon panel was brought together to evaluate the connections between uh, having an, a, an extra Y chromosome and, uh, and so-called, you know, the so-called connections uh, to antisociality and criminality. Uh, this report, um, the report on the uh, so-called XYY chromosome abnormality was produced by the National Institutes of Mental Health Center for the Studies of Crime and Delinquency. And I've actually traced the actual physical location, and it's actually right outside, uh, about a mile away from the Bethesda, Maryland campus. So this report was produced um, in... Uh, in a, uh, basically around the same time as the, the Task Force on Homosexuality, and just as a reminder, by the same institute. And as in the NIMH report, uh, there was a consistent argument that there needed to be more research. And I would argue that this opened uh, the door to the continuation of what I call hypothetical eugenics. And this is the bottom illustration on the right from Gerald Stein's Biosocial Genetics, published in 1977. So by hypothetical uh, eugenics, I mean essentially eugenic questioning, this idea that 
um, we should pursue a program of eugenics uh, and we should pursue a, 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 a further study of distinguishing populations uh, simply because we simply do not have uh, the answers. Um, and uh, this, I think, is a, is a really pernicious way of, of thinking about uh, medical and genetic research, because even by 1977, there were clear answers to all of these questions. And all of these questions had been uh, decisively settled, where uh, a question such as, should society allow individuals with XXY to reproduce is very obviously, very obviously yes, uh, but the idea that this was somehow uh, to be questioned is a is a deeply eugenic premise. So in conclusion, I think understanding the degree of historical support of eugenics and scientific racism in the genetics genomic, and genomics community is essential to building an ethical and just genomics today. One can hope in the sophistication of genetic science such as the recent production of the complete sequence of a Y chromosome, uh, and in its capacity to dispel eugenic and racist myths around Kleinfelter and Jacobs. Uh, and in this way, genomics can be an anti-eugenic uh, inquiry. And I think it's really up to scientists, science communicators, humanists, and others to combat the weaponization of genetics especially those studies which will inevitably be used to surveil and marginalize already stigmatized populations. And I think as a, as a final note before I, I conclude and hand it uh, over to Oss, that um, really, the in my view, um, it's not a question of if genetic studies will be weaponized, it's simply when. Um, and we can talk more about that in the question and answer session about, about genetics, study design, and, and weaponization. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, our final presenter for this panel is Os Keys, a PhD candidate at the University of Washington. And their panel is called, or sorry, sorry, their paper is called Science Shaping Policy, Policy Shaping Science. Okay. Um, we'll go from here. Before uh, I kick off, um, I'm going to start with perhaps the most unlikely thing that anyone's going to say today. Uh, while we've heard a lot of um, negative things about John Money, quite understandably, I would like to take a moment to say something nice about him and uh, talk about an aspect of him that is underappreciated, which is his incredible pettiness as a human being. Um, so. As part of the project I've uh, been working on, I've, I've interviewed, I think, 165 people, including around 20 who knew him in the context of um, you know, being his student, being his patient, being his uh, colleague. And there's this one odd snippet that I keep running into um, that I'm curious about what, uh, whether people agree that, that there's some there there. And that is that um, Chris mentioned the John Joan case, the very famous case of uh, Twins, one uh, surgically reassigned after a botched circumcision, one not having not had the botched circumcision. Um, when Money first started doing his work in the 50s, when he came up with the term gender identity, he actually did so in collaboration with a pair of um, academics, the, a married couple, the Hampsons, um, who he fell out with in the late 50s to the point where Richard Green um, reported that when he went to visit the three of them at uh, Johns Hopkins, um, you know, money would would tell his secretary to go next door and tell Professor Hanson that et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they literally weren't talking. And it got to the point where the Hansons moved out to the University of Washington, in fact, uh, which is where I am. Um, and amongst other things, founded an early uh, trans research project here, which is how I, I sort of dug into them. Um, the Hampson's names were John and Joan. And of the 20 people I've spoken to who knew money, none of them had spotted that coincidence before. And also none of them thought it was a coincidence. Um, he, he consciously or unconsciously seems to have disliked them so much to pseudonymously name his patients after them. Anyway, so today's talk, as this uh, suggests, is on um, medicine, 
specifically transgender medicine. Um, and the intersection between scientific research and policy in that space, not just for the sake of people doing work in this space, but also because I think there are useful things to learn here about the relationship between science and policy um, more broadly. It comes from a book that I'm writing on the history of, uh, I'm calling it trans science, it's the history of scientific research being interwoven with trans medicine, which is based on uh, way too many archives and some 165 interviews at this point. Um, I've never presented any of this before, so if it is a bit um, stop and start, uh, please forgive me and understand. So when we think about the relationship of science and policy, we often use the term co-constructed, right? So by that, we mean that policy work shapes what science is done and how it is done. Um, scientific research shapes policy. Um, and when it comes to science shaping policy, we often think of it as taking sort of one of two forms. Um, one is science as reason. So scientific studies say the best policy decision is X, and so we go do X. Um, this is kind of the promise of a lot of science policy work, right? That we will provide unambiguous answers as to what the best choice to make in a particular situation is. Um, but a lot of the time, scientific work can't really promise, like, you know, meet this promise. Um, but that doesn't mean that it isn't powerful in a different way, and that is as justification, right? Um, precisely because of the cultural potency of following the science as an idea, uh, scientific work tends to be a useful rhetorical tool in policy making. Um, policy based actors deploy or alternately dispute the meaning of scientific evidence, the value of science, scientific expertise in pursuit of decisions that they frankly already intended to make, but wanted a more culturally authoritative justification for. Science doesn't necessarily serve as the reason for a decision, but it does serve as the explanation. So this is how we tend to talk about it, at least in science and technology studies. Um, but the cultural power of going with the science or science-based policy means that science and policy interactions take a third form too, which we might call science as promise or science as hope. So the cultural narrative that policy should follow the science, and more specifically, that policy does follow science, has a corollary, right? And that is that if you want to change policy, you should do scientific research, and then you can use your results to argue for alterations to governmental approaches or regulations or so on and so forth. Science essentially serves as a promise or a source of hope for those who want to change policy. If we do the right studies, we can make a difference to how things are run. Um, and so what I want to talk about here is what the science and policy interactions that that kind of idea of hope or promise produces, looking specifically at the history of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, or WPATH. So WPATH is um, a organization previously known as the Harry Benjamin International Gender Dysphoria Association, or HABIGDA, which I think we'll all agree is a much less sort of rolling off the tongue acronym. Um, and it's the main professional association for practitioners who are interested in transgender health. At least historically, their primary focus has been authoring and distributing the standards of care, which, as the name suggests, constitute recommended guidelines for practices around the provision of gender affirming care. These standards are widely followed for both mundane day to day reasons. Doctors generally prefer to have a sense that what they're doing is what doctors do. Um, and because, particularly in a US context, following standards of care carries important insurance and liability implications. The history of um, both the standards and WPATH itself, you know, it's, it's not commonly discussed, but it is pretty known. And everyone tells pretty much the same story. Essentially, in 1977, a group of physicians, commonly known as the Norfolk Committee, because that's where they were meeting, um, was organized to plan the future coordination of trans healthcare. It consisted of six doctors of various stripes, and it reported back in 1979 um, with the first version of the standards of care and the proposal that a professional association should be formed to oversee it. These proposals 
were accepted, and 40 plus years later, here we are. But why was that organization formed, and why did it take that particular form at that particular time? There are a lot of reasons that researchers have proposed for this. Um, some claim it was motivated by a desire to avoid malpractice concerns, right? If we come up with recommended standards, then people will follow them, then there will be fewer issues with uh, like bad outcomes for patients. Um, others say it's because it lets you avoid malpractice lawsuits. Um, jurisprudence around malpractice in the United States is pretty heavily tied, as I said, to following standards of care. Um, a more sort of prosaic explanation is it's just what you do. You know, doctors have professional associations in the same way that lawyers in my country have silly wigs. Um, and a more pedestrian explanation is that someone had to organize the biannual conferences and the nonprofit that had previously been doing it was closing down. Um, and all of these explanations, I would argue, are correct, but there is a um, missing component of this, I'd argue, which is scientific research. That served as a really important motivation to founding this organization and writing these standards. Understanding why requires us to look a bit more at the history of gender-affirming care. So in the 60s and 70s, it was largely, although not as much as people think, centered on university-based gender identity clinics. Um, these were one-stop shops for psychiatric evaluations, hormones, and surgeries, and that they were at universities wasn't a coincidence because many of them were actually hybrid clinical and uh, scientific units that were established with the specific goal of finding out what the outcomes of treatment were for patients. The hope was that if you did such studies and if those studies showed that you know, positive results to patients, then that would legitimize gender affirming care. And it would influence insurance companies, medical providers, Medicare, Medicaid, to um, be more consistently supportive of providing such care and of paying doctors who did so. And by the early to mid 1970s, a lot of the studies at these various centers were reporting in, and all of them showed positive outcomes for the patients. But this didn't mean things were settled from the practitioner's perspective and certainly not from the perspective of policymakers, because there were also frequent critiques of the studies. Even though the results were all positive, um, individual study populations were seen as too small, and um, it was felt that the results were too patchy. Not enough patients reliably came back for follow-up evaluations after treatment. And so by about 1973, 1975, um, doctors, who are doing this research and having to argue with insurance companies about what it means and argue with their own professional associations about whether they are, you know, ahead of the curve or extremely off the deep end, are arguing and talking pretty seriously about how do we resolve this? How do we try and make it more certain? Now, these follow-up studies often had like five to 10 year reporting timelines. So you can't just change something next week and then everything will be fine. Um, you need to, amongst other things, be able to actually do more with the data you have. So they talk, for example, about establishing um, patient registries. If patients weren't reliably coming back to their original clinic for follow-up, doctors uh, involved in the field could create a national registry of patients to track them between clinics. This would also make it easier to do multi-site studies, to combine the data sets from multiple clinics follow-up processes and thereby overcome the small number of patients at each clinic. Instead of having um, five studies of 20 patients of whom may, you've got data on maybe 60%, the hope was you could have a study of 100 patients where you have data on all of them. Um, the problem is that both of these things are extremely hard. There's no free lunch in research. Uh, if you want a patient registry, you need money and time and a central hub or group of people to organize it around. Um, and if you want multi-site studies, you have to standardize diagnostic and treatment approaches. It's no use um, combining the data from five clinics if they all evaluated and treated patients differently. So you need a single set of standards and you need a central organizational hub. Or as one of the Norfolk committee members put it, 
You need closer ties and communications between our teams and some ways to meld our experience and create inclusive definitions and standards of care. And the result of all of this a couple of years later was the creation of the standards of care and an organization to provide those closer ties and communications. What's now WPATH, whose original bylaws did not set out its mission as promoting evidence-based care, education, research, public policy, and respect in transgender health, as it now reads, but instead to provide a mechanism whereby professionals may interact and communicate with each other in the context of research on and treatment of gender dysphoria. And looking at the personal correspondence of the early sort of the Norfolk committee members and the early presence of the organization, we can see that the few years after its founding were very much centered on theorizing how they would set up these registries, these multi-site studies, how they would standardize intake forms. And while none of these things ended up happening for reasons that would take far too long to get into, um, it is indicative, I think, that it wasn't just a justification. It was something that they actively put work into. And scientific interests and motivations didn't stop with the initialization of the organization. Um, they also made their way into the content. So the standards are often attributed to the entire Norfolk Committee, which, depending on how you cut it, featured between three and four gender identity clinic uh, positions and two to three private practitioners. Um, but really, this isn't the case. Even though there were six or seven names on it, um, both interviews and written statements suggest that standards came largely from one source, which was the practice approach taken at the University of Texas Medical Branch, or UTMB, uh, university-based gender identity clinic. In fact, when the standards were released, UTMB actually bragged that the final draft of the standards had very few modifications from their clinical practice approach. And this isn't just a piece of historical trivia, it's really, really important because the practice approach at UTMB was explicitly designed not only for patient care, but also to enable research. And so what we see with this process of the UTMB guidelines becoming standards of care and is really a research protocol becoming naturalized as the baseline ground level, this is how trans healthcare should be administered, this is the process it should follow. So the point of all of this is that when we talk about the meaning of science in policy spaces, we have to go more than just ask, uh, you know, what is it that legislators do with scientific studies? Or what is it, how is it that judges evaluate them? We also have to ask about the promise of science, about the way that our insistence and our belief and our hope that scientific studies will be the basis on which policy decisions are made changes what people do. In 1977, trans medicine consists of a lot of clinics that talk to each other but aren't really well coordinated and are all kind of doing their own thing. In 1979, they're largely following a uniform set of standards that are in turn based on research protocols. And this stems, at least in part, from the belief and the hope by the clinicians that if they did this, if they got better data, it would impact policy spaces. And so the experience of trans patients, not only across the country, but across the world, were fundamentally altered by this desire to produce data. Even though the researchers themselves might have been thinking only about research, their actions impacted the field of medicine as a whole. So that is me. I hopefully have come in, if not under time, then pretty close to time. Um, and yeah, I'm excited for the, the Q&A. Thank you so much. You did a wonderful job with time. There are no time problems here. Um, it is my role to inaugurate a Q&A and a conversation. Um, before I get to audience questions or questions from me, I wonder if any of you might have questions for each other or just want to have a little bit of intra-panel dialogue before we jump out. I, I could jump in. My, my screen's just gone up. Ah. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, yeah, but it's, for, it's for you, Chris, actually. It just um, certainly as, as, as um, people listening might have picked up from my presentation, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated about the kind of 
interaction between scholarly and popular discourses. And the only time where I've come across previously this, this idea of X, Y, Y, um, is actually in, in Sarah S. Richardson's book, Sex Itself. Um, and in it, there's, there's a, a picture of a, a pulp, really it's kind of pulp fiction paperbacks called The XYY Man uh, by Kenneth Royce, introducing Spider Scott, the cat burglar who's gone straight, almost fast, violent, good. Um, really kind of glamorizing this idea of XYY as a, as a kind of a hyper, hyper man. This is from 1970. And there's a picture of, you know, handsome chap looking very butch and a, a scantily clad young lady next to that. Um, how does that work out? How does that narrative, this glamorization of XYY, which is happening almost at the same time as this pathologization? Yeah. I mean, where are the boundaries? I mean, perhaps there aren't any. Well, well that, that's what makes this in the context of, of, of popular culture so fascinating because it's because of this of this this notion around criminality criminality and sort of valorization at the same time right yes. so it's like this it's this whole issue around you know all of these juvenile delinquency novels and movies right so you have in the united states and in the uk i imagine these really amazing films about these suave uh, you know, hyper masculine, uh, you know, uh, individuals who uh, n nonetheless serve as kind of moral tales. Um, so there's a liminality to them. They're, they are uh, uh, the these these suave criminals, and it's because it's this equal notion of angel and beast. And you get this uh, in the fiction of like uh, Frank Norris, for example, in the United States, or even even Wells. It's the ability, it's this idea of because these individuals are out are seen as outside the 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 social, political, biological norms, they are they are both sort of you know seen as a as a as um you know things to be to be followed and to be desired, but also to be drawn away from at the same time. And a lot of the discussions around so-called deviance and criminality look to this duality of 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 the 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 of the criminal leader or something like this. And I think that's very much the same thing. It's a it's a it's a fascination that comes out of the duality of the two of the dynamic between the two poles. And you see this in a, a lot of 20th century fiction and and literary naturalism and things like that. Is is that Sensible enough. I think it's the dynamic. Absolutely, yes. I, 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 it's some something that's come up because we can extend it to the, the science, scientific narratives, and the, and the texts that we've been talking about. Other people have been talking about during the day. Um, but this, this, it seems bizarre, and yet it seems so um, consistent. This coexistence of utterly opposing ideas, right? Um, even the same people on the one hand, um, absolutely getting very excited about multiplicity of sexes and sex changes and sexualities. And right. on the other hand, in different contexts, sometimes to different audiences, right. situating the most chronic binary stereotypes. Right. And this is the neo-romantic duality of opposites, right? So the <laughs> Jekyll and Hyde, right? <laughs> so there's, there's some really deep roots to this. And you could go to Freud, you can go to uh, of how to... How does how does something which uh, inspires awe also inspires repulsion? And this is the 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 space of the entirety of the of Central Europe. And these are these are uh, and psychoanalysis and the behavioral sciences. And this is these this is why these vicious stereotypes are are so difficult to get rid of mm -hmm. because yeah. they're so flexible and they yeah. and they speak. You know, there is something which there the the adaptation of these of these dualistic stereotypes, one and yet the other at the same time at the opposite poles, is also one of the key sort of rhetorics around eugenics. And why is why is eugenics pervasive? Because it's it allows a, a kind of flexibility and malleability to situation of being two things at once many times. Yes. Thank you.
Yeah, I think that's a, a really thoughtful insight and one that I've heard reflected on earlier panels as well, that like these things are internally inconsistent, <laughs> right? Um, and if they were not internally in inconsistent, we probably wouldn't be having a two-day symposium on how to figure them out, right? Is that it actually what we have is a, a competing sets of, um, you know, often incommensurate or incommensurate um, goals, right? Like, the, so the goal of a patient versus the goal of a scientist. So I wonder if we can speak to those sort of populations and where, and where we find the stress in those goals. I'm thinking about, I, I know, I'm most familiar with WPATH, right? And the way that there is tension, right? Between those who want to study trans people and those who want to use trans medicine to achieve their own sort of somatic or psychological um, forms of transition. Um, but I think there's other instances here too. I mean, I'm sure there are people who have some of these genetic differences who might have at some point been able to speak back to scientists. Um, so I wonder if we can sort of talk about you know, or drill in on where those tensions emerge and whether or not there's sort of alternate definitions of some of these uh, uh, phenomena emerging from patient groups themselves. I mean, so for me, the I, I read too much. Um, and actually, on that note, I will, um, as much as I love, I can't believe I'm about to say this. This is another unsayable sentence. As much as I love Freud, um, I would really recommend that people also check out Margaret Shildrick's work on embodiment and monstrosity. Um, I read too much and the thing I find uh, every time, whether it's reading or reflecting on my own experiences or doing my field work is that the ultimate question that the tension tends to, tends to come down to is who is this for? You know, is the knowledge to inform it is the knowledge to protect the doctor and their reputation or the patient and their life? Is the knowledge to protect the real visceral patient immediately being monitored or a hundred hypothetical patients in the future? Um, is it for the sake of uh, patients specifically or is it, well, we might know, so learn so many things about gender writ large or disability writ large and normalcy writ large. Um, the, if, if we study this particular sort of like group, um, I wish it was possible for me to say that there is an easy answer to all of these questions. I have a default, but I think it's complicated enough that, that I'll pass it back over. I'll jump in. I mean, tensions and, and eugenics, uh, it's, I mean, just, it, it's riddled with it. uh, these um, uh, internally consistent uh, tensions. Um, and one of them is that when you look at the huge literature, I'm, I'm thinking my, my research is very much based in the early 20th century at the moment. Um, and this absolute um, avalanche of, of numbers and statistics and charts about uh, people um, and all these uh, genealogies um, I, I put in my slide about um, intersex people that, who are, who are um, uh, uh, identified very early on and intersex sub subjects um, uh, become some you know, early uh, eugenic targets at the same time as Darwin is saying that everyone is intersex, and uh, early Mendelian geneticists very much uh, talking about layers of sex, latent sex, and, and, and stuff. And, and the tension really with, with, with eugenics is, is that really nobody is exempt. I mean, if, if eugenicists had chased and gone after everyone who they identified as having some kind of defective inheritance in their books, there would be nobody left. Um, and that's, you know, the, the, you, you can feel them dealing with these tensions, especially in the, um, you start getting this, this, this idea of reform eugenics. I spoke about Amram Scheinfeld, um, and he, he actually kind of tries to, to kind of unravel some of these tensions in terms of um, his, his spectrum of, of, of sexes and stuff. 
Um, and he also talks about homosexuality as well and, and kind of starts hinting towards um, that uh, eugenicists really should be leaving homosexuals alone and, and what have you. Um, but it doesn't work out because he's still hanging on to the kind of the basic precepts of, of, of eugenics, which, you know, is, 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 is um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's such a poisonous ideology. It, it, it just, it's like ideological, ideological acid. Um, it really just uh, destroys everything it touches, and and nobody, not not the eugenicists or the uh, uh, the people that they're, they're trying to uh, victimise, you know, escapes escapes that. Yeah, I mean, just going to Ross's point a little bit, I think, um, and I, I think I want to emphasise too that when we're talking about you, you know, eugenics as a as an ideology. Uh, and these conversations can get very general, but I also want to emphasize that this had really dire, uh, irrevocable consequences through sterilization and, and stigmatization and confinement. So it's it's a, not an idle discussion, uh, even though we are talking about it as a, as a theory. But I think what eugenics, the tension of eugenics is between two things, or often between two things, between can, between simplicity and complexity, right? So, so eugenics at its core is this idea that there are simple solutions to complex uh, problems, whether it be social cohesion or or that that eugenics is this ideology that essentially has the answer to question A, question B, question C, question D. And eugenics ideology at the same time, I think, also tries to, to address complexity by essentially taking things that it describes as that it would see as liminal and putting those individuals often into into discrete categories so and i think that's one of the and that's why you have these idea of the and the reason why these populations these communities are so are so studied over and over and over again is because the as an ideology which people practice there is a, there is a real desire to take something which is complex and and make it simple and when addressed with complexity try to make it simple again so it's it's this real feedback loop that i think really provides a, 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 a danger, uh, really gives us a notion of, if we look at it, what, you know, we should be asking ourselves, is our science, is our inquiry into human beings, into nature, whatever, is it ever like this? Uh, have we formed a kind of closed loop or are we open to to things that, that um, that we may not have uh, answers to. And I think that's kind of an anti-eugenic, anti-racist also rhetoric and practice. Yeah, that's that's a really helpful, I think, way to think about these complex questions. Um, I have two questions. One is an off-specific question, and then I have one that's a sort of larger, I think, reflective question. So I'll save that one for a second. Um, First, in this off-specific question, you know, what what can we learn from the W path history that might help us not repeat some of the same errors? So this person is concerned about maybe you know some of the organizing around intersex medicine and thinking about how to make that you know more inclusive. Um, but in particular, just sort of what you know, what can we learn? What can we learn from W path? Which I think is a very funny question to someone who is a little. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and take that. As a standalone question, um, that is, I think, the topic of the next book I'll be writing, which is everything that's happened since about 1985. Um, I, I guess I'd say um, that there are two crucial, two crucial sort of lessons, right? Um, the first is, I would say, uh, science won't save us, by which I mean, and that's a very strong claim, so let me contextualize it. Um, all of these studies were done out of the belief that scientific expertise, scientific studies results would uh, move the needle on public and institutional acceptance. 
Um, as someone who has now spent way more time than any human being should uh, going through all of the jurisprudence and case files from the 60s, 70s, 80s around this, um, most of the time scientific studies did not really play a role either way in deciding the shape of healthcare access for trans people. Um, so the premise on which the organization was structured in this very particular way didn't hold water. You ended up with an organization that was oriented in a particular fashion for no reason. All of the downsides with none of the positives. Um, and I think that that is the maybe the second lesson is there are costs to um, orienting around legitimization, respectability, science. Um, it, in the uh, 90s, particularly in the early 2000s, uh, WPATH more became, I think, a place where patient voices were voices, um, at least more than it was previously. Previously, there was, uh, it, it was incredibly difficult for a trans person to even be a member of the organization, much less present or be involved in governance. In the 90s to early 2000s, um, that shifted largely through sort of social pressure inside and outside the organization. Um, and right now with everything going on and with the language of science being used by the people trying to push against trans healthcare, um, I have this fear that we are in a potential inflection point, I guess, where it could look like the organization and the process doubling down on scientific authority and legitimacy and so on and so forth. Um, and so undoing and unraveling a lot of those very beneficial changes to how standards, how the standards are made. Um, I would encourage people involved in WPATH to not let them do it. There is a, a reason to worry, right? Which is that when patients are involved in trans healthcare decision-making, and we see this right now, um, people yell that WPATH is no longer a medical organization. It's part of the trans industrial complex which is always hilarious to me as a term, because if there's a whole industrial complex, I'd like to know why I don't have a job. Um, but as, as one of the people I was interviewing uh, who's involved in WPATH governance, who is a cisgender clinician, like put it, is nobody goes around yelling that the Diabetes Association of America is the diabetes industrial complex because they involve diabetics in deciding what diabetes care should look like. Like this is a very specific claim. And I think it is easy for um, a lot of otherwise very well-intentioned people to look at all of the yelling about scientific uncertainty and say, oh, well then we've got to do more science. And they're yelling about how we need to be like, you know, we're not being scientifically reliable enough. Then we need to have as much professionalization and expertise as possible. But when you do that, you cut out a lot of, voices and you uh, unravel a lot of really hard fought victories for patients and patient advocates. And uh, yeah, that concerns me, we'll say. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think that's a very comprehensive and and clear answer to that question. Um, we have a couple of different conversations going on in the, in the chat right now, but I, I wanna bring up one that has gotten a lot of, I think, attention. Um, we all know that this is a sort of live political issue, right, in which there is, a lot of desire by people to codify what sex and gender might mean. Um, and then the fact that there's a lot of organization around this from certain political actors. Um, so what do we all, you know, what can we imagine as the future of sex and gender research if there is some sort of attempt by policymakers to try to codify or solidify definitions of sex? Um, you know, imagine that there is legislation, for example, that, that defines sex in a certain way uh, based on sort of chromosomal potentially attributes. Um, you know, what could we do in, in that case to further the type of research that you all are looking into? Or what do you think of the harms might be of that type of legislation? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I was talking um, 
No, I, I as a historian, I, I spend my time looking back and, tr and trying not to look forward. Um, uh, and it's, there's such uh, a conversation historically. This goes on, um, and there, there have been times before where there has been this same drive um, uh, to, to um, systematize, define, uh, codify sets in terms of law. Um, it happens um, uh, often at very particular times um, uh, when cherished gender and sexual norms are perceived to be under threat. And often it's very, uh, it's, it, it's very conversational. Um, and I can think of very, very specific instances um, when, when um, uh, trans megastar Christine Jorgensen visited um, England, for example. I think it was in 1950, early 1950s, 52 or 54, and uh, uh, performed um, the, the, the Manchester Hippodrome. Just that simple act, um, some physicians wrote into um, the, the British Medical Journal, the Lancet, one of the, one of the major British medical journals, to do just this, we, we need a definition of sex because they felt so threatened by Jorgensen's appearance. I mean, this is, um, uh, you know, it's, there's a level at which it's laughable, um, but also I, th I think um, you know, the lessons uh, from those kind of instances, um, uh, when, when you look at the historical trajectories and how, it's why I take a, a, try and take a, a broader view of looking at and charting how these narratives change over time and why they change. They come and go. And it's, it's, it's very much, I think, a, a matter of, of, of keeping, it's a matter, it's a matter of education and, and keeping these conversations going that we've been, we've been having today um, in, in all kinds of ways. Um, they work over time. They really do. And, and just lifting people's knowledge of, of the kind of things that we've been talking about today, I, I find hope in it. And the fact that there are, as you say, these these, these people, these these groups who are um, uh, trying to codify sex in different ways, you know, it, it's happening because things are actually changing for the better. Um, it's it's shedding a skin, I think, I believe. Um, and yes, although, though it's very unpleasant, um, you know, history shows that those, those kind of efforts um, uh, are often very unsuccessful um, for the reasons we've been talking about today, I think. Um, defining sex is incredibly uh, difficult business. They, they are unsuccessful, but I, before we are too optimistic, uh, I would note that their failures also carry a body count. Oh, sure. Yes. I mean, that, that's why I'm, I, I tend to look back and try not to look forward. Um, um, my, my, my optimism does have its limits. <laughs> I, I would say just um, emphasizing Ross and Oss's points that if you look at the history of the 20th century, efforts, any effort by any government to do the thing you suggest, Cass, leads to, not only doesn't end well but but leads to um, irreplaceable just immeasurable harm and, um, there are numerous numerous examples of this and one of my concerns of a historian is that oftentimes historians become very uh, concerned when the present starts looking like the past. And I, I think that's something that, as historians, we have to be very mindful of the fact that um, scientific progress leads to uh, to basically nothing if if there's no acknowledgement of, of grievous past mistakes, either by individuals, organizations, or governments. So that's that's my concern too, is that um, is that things are being repeated in such a way that I, I think are going to really lead to harm to individuals and communities in a, in a way that I don't want to become part of history again. <laughs> Hi, I, I, yeah, I know that was a hard question to 
answer, right, for a group of historians. Um, I'm going to give you another hard one for a group of historians. Um, someone's asking about um, advice for clinicians in training. And I actually think this is maybe an important opportunity for historians to get to talk to uh, you know, future scientists or scientists, because most of the time people don't like to listen to historians. Um, so here's your opportunity to be listened to. <laughs> um, you know, how how do you how do you think that um, you would advise future historians working in these areas and who also understand some of the risks that you're bringing up here? Well, I always point out that when you're talking about eugenics, when you're talking about the use of biology and genetics towards dehumanization. Um, that it's not in the past, that it's in the present. And actually, the, the, the past allows you to specifically say why these things are present and why it's relevant and why it's contemporary. So that's, that would be my quick answer. I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep my optimist's hat on as well with, with my answer and talk specifically about uh, queer students, LGBTQIA plus students that I, I, I've taught and had experiences with, um, and who are arrive incredibly anti science, anti doctors, anti medicine, because of the experiences that they've had and, and because of the narratives that have been kicking around, eugenically infused narratives about pathologization. Um, and so, really, when I start talking about science and history of science, a, they're a bit surprised, um, and also really they're, they're liberated by it when you actually get this um, uh, history, which has, has has really not been told in a way. Um, when it was, I spoke about Darwin earlier, and, and the historical narratives as well as scientific narratives have not been taught to us before in a way that has been inclusive of, of queer people. And so when you actually start unpacking it, um, you know, the, the, there's science belongs to everyone, um, queer people, history of science belongs to everyone, LGBT people, and there shouldn't be this area where we where we fear to tread. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, um, certainly teaching our history of, of uh, sexes and genders and sexualities, um, uh, particularly to queer people, I, I think it's, it's it's a really liberating experience um, that that actually gets people interested in science itself. I guess with a specific focus not on future historians or future scientists, but future clinicians, um, I, I would suggest two things which are cognitively dissonant collectively. Um, but I find that all of the most important lessons in life require you to sort of maintain a conscious cognitive dissonance. Um, the first is to genuinely listen to and engage with your patients, even when this makes you uncomfortable. One of my opening questions when I started researching what I'm researching, one thing that I found really interesting as a question was, there were, you know, if we say there were sort of 100,000 physicians in the US in the 50s and 60s, maybe 100 of them became actively and publicly involved in trans medicine. Why? What makes that those 100 special, right? And sometimes the answer is, you know, fascination and scientific interest, but sometimes the answer was that they were either, and I think this is crucial, very, very close to retirement or very, very soon out of medical school. They weren't trying to follow the, this is what everyone should do, this is what your colleagues will think of you. They were learning in a very honestly phenomenological way from their patients and they were engaging deeply with their patients and even the ways that they um, trained each other to engage in this new area of medicine involved that kind of, um, embodied, sometimes effective, sometimes literally tactile um, experiences of, of learning and engagement. Um, that is something that I know that in some segments of medical education, particularly around um, sort of early surgical training, uh, I know that a lot of medical schools try to make sure that that happens. I know also that there are so many opportunities in medicine to burn out, to cease listening, to be so exhausted that you just 
can't engage that deeply. Um, try your darndest to not let medicine take that ability away from you and to revel in it where you can. Um, and then the other thing, and I, this is why I say cognitively dissonant, when you do this, you will screw up. Not purposefully, not because you are not trying your best, but because any approach you take, you will screw up. There's this phrase that historians love, or at least philosophers of history love, which is the thought of an age is of an age. And one way of putting it, uh, of, of framing that is to say, hey, before you judge people in the 19, in the 1890s for thinking that grafting monkey testicles into people would make them immortal, remember that they had their particular conceptual frameworks that they were working from. And within those conceptual frameworks, this was probably a perfectly logical thing to do. It's about humility in judging the past. But I also think that it should be about humility in judging the present. We also live in an age. Our thought is also of an age. We are people who in 20 years may indeed be written about just as scathingly as we write about the people we write about. My personal life goal is to ensure that none of my work is of interest after I die. I feel that if any of it is relevant, either positively or negatively, that implies either that I didn't solve any of the problems I was interested in, or I screwed them up. Um, you're going to be judged. It happens. It's inevitable. You can't be looking over your shoulder at history or for historians in determining what you do. Do the best you can with what you have right now. I think that's such a, um, I don't know, it's a, I was going to say, is it optimistic to hope that your work isn't, <laughs> is it pessimistic? Let's say it's realistic, right? As scholars that we, we all know that nobody, you know, <laughs> um, you have to be really uh, a problem for people to dig your work up later. Um, no, but I really appreciate this conversation. And I, I have another question, um, which is really just a factual one. I thought it'd be interesting to, to ask you, um, what about students who want to study the things that you study? Um, where would you recommend that they go? Should they go to PhD school? Should anyone go to PhD school? Um, are there particular programs that people should go to if they want to learn more about the types of work that you're doing? Um, just, you know, if people are jealous of your careers, how should they become people like you? If you are jealous of my career, please seek immediate psychiatric attention. Um, Honestly, if you're interested in the kind of, my, my trajectory has been a strange one. I'm a lawyer by training. I then went into a engineering program where I do the history and sociology of medicine. Um, the recommendation I would have is you should go to grad school. You won't, it's, it's definitely type two fun. Um, you will enjoy having done it a lot more than you will enjoy doing it, but it is an unsurpassable opportunity to read everything you want and work out what kind of person you want to be, to paraphrase Gorky. Um, if you're interested in having the kind of chaotic all over the place, studying what you're interested in, hybridizing methods and fields of study stuff that I tend to do, um, my recommendation would be don't look for a department by topic area. Look for a department that expects you to be interdisciplinary and an advisor who will leave you free to be so. You know, my I'm in an engineering school, but I also took a class on Foucault in the history department and classes in bioethics and gender studies and information, the information school and, and the freedom and ability to do that has been so much more valuable to my uh, education than it, it definitely overcomes the occasional annoyances, like my committee telling me that the department's only reading expectations for our general exam are 20 papers or equivalent, and me having to argue with them that I should get to read actual books to, for it to be determined whether I can become a PhD candidate. Anyway, so yeah, look for, look for flexibility, not for focus. Right. I would just quickly say, uh, look for and find a, a mentor that you work really well with. And that may not be uh, you, a dissertation mentor. I, I had a fantastic mentor for my dissertation. Uh, 
Ross and I also share a mentor. Mario Storda has 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 supported my work for years and years and years. Uh, and I've I've been so lucky also at the NIH to do the work that I do now. And write. Everyone needs to write more. <laughs> yeah, find your own way. Follow your vibes. Um, that's what I did. Um, and I'm going to continue what, what Chris has just said um, about Marius Turden and, and give a, a shining advert to my, my university. I did my BA. Um, this is at Oxford Brooks University, so the smaller university in Oxford. I did my BA there. Um, then I went off thinking a bigger university would be better. Um, I walked out of two of those and then went back to Oxford Brooks with my tail between my legs and studied under Marius Turder. I did my MA, my PhD there, um, and now uh, uh, teaching um, and I maintain my, my, my association with them. So really the, the lesson bigger is not necessarily better. I think that's good advice for a lot of <laughs> scientific and academic endeavors is like find the person who actually uh, knows what you're talking about and also find some freedom to do what you want to do um, rather than following their structure. Um, I say this as someone with a PhD in English literature who <laughs> does not write about books anymore. Um, but that should conclude this uh, this panel session. I really appreciate all the time and attention. Um, this is like such a good opportunity to get to listen to people who understand the sort of long durée, you know, from the from early 20th century all the way on and some of these really complex issues that, you know, as we've talked about are live, you know, political controversies today. So thank you so much for your time and your expertise and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Cass. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chris. So much everyone. And thank you to all the attendees as well. I appreciate that particularly for those on the East Coast time, it is rather late in the day and you've been sat for quite a while. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Parker. My pronouns are she and her, and I serve as director of the Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office in the NIH Office of the Director. I'm so pleased to be a part of this remarkable two-day symposium. However, I am the one who has been given the difficult task of summarizing today. I would first like to give a special thank you to the presenters, your enthusiastic response to the invitation to participate, buoyed our excitement for the symposium and confirmed the need for these conversations. I would also like to thank everyone who has joined us today to listen in. Your thoughtful questions have helped to make the discussions rich and nuanced. Thank you to everyone behind the scenes as well who has helped to make today's session run so smoothly. Finally, I would like to give a special thank you to the other sponsors of the symposium, NHGRI and ORWH. In particular, my colleagues who I was so fortunate to work with on planning this event, from NHGRI, Liz Deet, Sarah Bates, Brittany Kish, and Christopher Donahue, and from ORWH, Elizabeth Barr. For those of you unfamiliar with the role of the NIH Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office, we are charged with helping to increase research on sexual and gender minority populations, including intersex people and those with variations in sex characteristics. We are also focused on removing barriers to conducting SGM-related research and identifying ways that any research funded by NIH can be more inclusive and affirming for SGM populations. Data collection and the challenges steeped in the culture of science are also key areas of interest and activity for our office. Considering these priorities for the SGMRO, I am deeply grateful for today's discussions and I look forward to next steps. To close out today's session, I would like to highlight some of the key takeaways that resonated with me as I think about the work that we do in the Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office. First, we heard about the complexities of sex and gender and the need for precision and specificity in our language, definitions, and reporting in healthcare research and educational settings. How we categorize sex as consequential in science and healthcare and is critical as we think about the social, legal, and ethical implications of our work. Inclusivity and moving away from the sex and gender binaries are critical to being scientifically accurate and clin clinically meaningful. We also heard about the need to question how science informs policy and how politics informs science, and how science is political. 
scientific authority, scientific policies, and the binary framework of sex and gender impact access to research and healthcare, including medications. We also heard about administrative burden and erasure that can negatively impact access to services, research, and care. We learned about the need to think more critically about how populations are excluded or included in research conception, development, execution, and reporting. And we learned about how the ethics of inclusion and exclusion are not considered nearly enough in research. Research often excludes specific populations based on assumptions related to sex and gender. The lack of definitions of sex in research complicates these issues. And while sex and gender are often stipulated in research protocols, they are rarely confirmed. It is important also to examine what this means for rigor and reproducibility of our research outcomes. More research and clinical expertise are needed in these spaces and approaches need to go beyond biology to understand the interface of science and culture. This is critical as we know that both our culture and science can be oppressive and siloed. We also know that operationalizing sex and gender in research is necessary to answer complex questions about human health and about how studying history and looking beyond human health can help illuminate answers to our current questions and improve our understandings of sex and gender. We were challenged appropriately to think about the problematic nature of the sex as a biological variable policy and how it falsely casts our understanding of sex as biological truth. We also heard about the challenges related to oversimplification of sex and gender in data collection. This highlights the need for more and better data collection, including organ inventories that go beyond the single sex marker. We know that more high quality inclusive research is needed in how we define sex and gender, how we measure sex and gender, and how we deal with the dearth of clinical expertise and clinical guidelines that go beyond binary sex and gender categories. And we were reminded about the need to move away from just studying intellectually interesting ideas, but really the need to move to a model of seeking understanding of what the community needs and wants and how the community can be included in research throughout the entire process, beginning at question development. Questions that are necessary for moving research forward are, how is this research serving people? How are assumptions serving as barriers to this research? And who isn't at the table? Finally, we discussed the importance of taking a historical perspective, including recognizing the history of eugenics and studies about genetics and stigma in understanding where we are today. We also recognize the historical role that NIH and other government agencies have played in the weaponization of so-called sex chromosomes. And who is this work for? As our day comes to a close, I'd like to leave you with a final thought. And that is that NIH research is for all people. At the heart of the discussions today is social justice and the lack of justice that we currently see in how the scientific community studies, prioritizes, and funds research with and for intersex and gender diverse populations. I personally am invigorated by the discussion today and I'm keenly aware of all that is left to be done to ensure that sex and gender are appropriately considered, studied, and reported on in NIH funded research. As a reminder, tomorrow we will hear from a variety of folks who will focus on the following. How and for whom can we do better? It's been a true pleasure to listen and learn with you today. I look forward to tomorrow and I hope that you do too. This concludes day one of our symposium. I wish you all a lovely evening.